Hello, folks. Welcome to Holding On with Holder. On this show, I interview interesting people to discuss interesting topics. My name is Steve Holder, and I am your host. With me this evening is Diamond Charday, host of Knowledge and Pettiness podcast. We will be talking about her podcast, her background, her interest, her thoughts on current events, and anything else she wants to talk about. So welcome, Diamond. Thanks for being here. No, thank you for having me. It's an, it's an honor. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about you, just to get us started. Who are you? Yes, who am I? That is quite the question. Um, so I'm from St. Louis, uh, born and raised, and um, basically became an engineer, um, moved around quite a bit, lived in a couple of different states. Uh, now I live in Houston, Texas. I work as a data engineer, um, I'm launching uh, Quality Aero Systems, which is uh, a company focused on modernizing quality management systems. Um, and I podcast, and I also am an adjunct instructor from New Hampshire University. So I'm kind of like all over the place. Um, you yeah. must be a smart person. <laughs> I, you know, I stick to uh, Albert Einstein's quote. It's not that I'm smarter than anyone. I just don't give up. I'm persistent. I stick with problems longer. There you go. Now, are you a mother? No. Well, dog mom. <laughs> okay, well, you had something, right? Somebody got to do it. Yes, I, I'm a dog mom to two beautiful schnauzers. Schnauzer pool. Schnauzers, okay. Yeah, the, those are my uh, pr protection. <laughs> I, see. I see. And I know you're a fun person. I can tell by talking to you just a little bit and watching your videos. So I know you're a fun person. Man, I just try to make the most out of life. That's, that's really been it for me. I right. just try to make the most out of it. What are your hobbies? Uh, I'm actually a runner. So uh, last year I competed in uh, 15 races. So uh, including a half marathon. So I run. Um, I, I think I'm funny, so I, I, in my mind, I'm a comedian, um, and uh, I, I think that's really it. I love outdoors. That's, that's kind of like my fun spaces. But well, since you said you're a comedian, you have to tell us a joke. So what's your favorite I, joke? I don't really like, I like more a situational comedian. So like more of like Dave Chappelle, Richard Pryor's. Eddie Murphy, like, I like that type Parkism. of uh, comedy. Yes, it's my love language. That's me. That's me. <laughs> me and you can go well. Yes, we will. Yeah. Uh, so what music do you like besides Beyonce? I know you like Beyonce. Of course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> I actually like a genre called uh, electronica. Uh, and it's really about groovy beats, uh, like, I I don't know the the sound is just capturing to me, so that's really my my uh, genre of music. I love like the Drakes. I love um, alternative music as well. So I love like Kings of Le Leon, um, Nickelback, of course. Um, but I really kind of like find home in like electronica, for sure. Uh, okay. I mostly listen to those old classics, Bob Seger and Ted Nugent and mm -hmm. Leonard Skinner and, you know, you probably never heard of them, right? I, I heard out of one of them, the Leonard Skinner. I heard one of them before. <laughs> okay, okay. So I also saw on one of your videos that you're a social introvert, but here you are. <laughs> yes, I am. Uh, that is probably like, for me, my favorite episode outside of like girl dad with my father. Um, and I like social introverts because um, it's so personal to me. Like my friends who know me, like we'll go on group trips and I'm notorious for just like going rogue. And it's nothing about them. It's not that I, I just get people out and I just got to get the hell away. Like, so like my college friends, we usually go on a trip every year. Um, except for COVID, obviously. Um, and like, I'll just dip and they're like, oh, diamonds just peopled out. And then they'll be like, text me in a couple hours. You cool? Like, you're safe? And I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll be on my way back. Well, I'm the same way. I'm actually a very shy person. 
You know? Really? I am. I am. You fooled me. Well, you know you fooled me. I mean, we'll do what we got to do, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Do what we got to do. I also saw on the video that you're tired of being cooped up. You want to be around people. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't like people, but I like people. It's, it's very weird. No, I understand. <laughs> I love yeah. you. Get away from me, right? Yeah, it's like, oh my God, I miss them. It, it's like that feeling when you go home and you're like, man, I really miss my family. And as soon as you walk in the door, you're like, damn, why I do this? Like, why am I here? <laughs> I love to see you come and I love to see you go, right? Absolutely. <laughs> if that was a person, it would be me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So tell us about your YouTube videos. Um. So honestly, with knowledge and pettiness on, on the YouTube side, it was just kind of like a test market uh, to see like, where was I getting the most traction? Um, and YouTube was, is fun, right? Uh, Cause it lives forever. That's my stamp on um, eternity. Um, however, like um, it's just been quite interesting getting the traction there. So um, I really have been focusing more on like Instagram and like just the traditional audio on podcasting. Um, not to say that I probably won't dabble back into YouTube, but at this point, mm, it's not really taking off the way I thought it would. So mm -hmm. mm, such is life. Well, maybe I can help you get the word out. Tell everybody to watch you. Oh yeah, that'd be nice. There you go. <laughs> What kind of childhood did you have? What time? But what happened? What kind of childhood did you have? Oh, child! How much time you got? Um, my childhood oh, my. was very. <laughs> my childhood was actually very interesting. Um, I was raised by my grandparents. Um, until they passed in about 1998. Well, my grandmother passed, and then my grandfather. So I was raised by my mom. Um, and um. My mom, uh, basically, it was me, her, and my sister. Um, for quite a bit, I wasn't allowed to see my dad. So um, I remember, like, just these years of, like, distance between us. We went from, like, um, my dad coming to get me when I stayed with my grandma to, like, nothing. Like, I couldn't call him, reach out to him, whatever. And I think around 13 or 14, um, back when phone books were prevalent, uh, I literally took the phone book and I knew he worked for a hospital in St. Louis. I didn't know which one or whatever, um, but I called every extension to every hospital until I found him. And that basically, um, I felt like I found a, that part of me again that was missing. So my childhood was, was interesting. Um, it was a lot of, uh, I feel like learning before I needed to in a like exposure to things that I, I didn't need to see. Um, but it was also what built me to be strong. So in the same breath, it's like, uh, I really didn't like that shit, but <laughs> it also helped me become who I am to be the resilient person I am. So, um, it was a necessary evil, I guess. Yeah. How would you say your childhood still affects you today? A lot. Um, definitely a lot because um i've always been like that weird black chick like uh i went through this phase where i tried to be like hood or gangster if you see me hear me i am not that person <laughs> like i can't pass um so i i had that like identity crisis like trying to fit in um and back where like the area in st louis i was it wasn't cool to be smart and I don't know why, like, it's, it's the stupidest thing ever. So I did a lot of things, like, um, I tapped more into my comedy side to try to make friends and all of that. But it was like being good at math, well, okay at math. I'm no expert, but being okay at math and doing really good in school, but, like, being teased about it. So I was like, mm, I'll be a class clown. I'll do that. So it was just, like, just trying to find who I, who I am. I think I spent a lot of time trying to do that. Yeah. I was the same way. I was the class clown and <laughs> would do anything for attention. Yeah. Even if it was a bad attention. 
as long as it was the attention. Yeah, and that can get you in trouble, can it? It got me into a lot of trouble. Oh yeah, it got me in a lot, a lot yeah. of trouble. Yeah. So, what would you say has been your biggest challenge in life so far? Mm. Wow. I would say the biggest challenge is just like living out something I never seen. So um, prior to me um, getting introduced to engineering through uh, the St. Louis Science Center, I had never met an engineer, never heard of it. It wasn't something that I guess people, um, my teachers or whatever, saw that I could be that. They, you know, it, it never was a career path. It, it was like, um, I, I don't think they saw it for me. So um, just seeing how to be a college graduate, what does it look like when like my dad did a, a stint in college, but like it, like as far as my cousins and all of that, um, majority of them didn't go to college. So um, even to this day, like it's still learning um, like I'm engaged, so like learning how to go through marriage and premarital counseling and all these things and see life and do life in a way that I've never seen it. That's probably like the hardest thing for me. Sometimes we have to make our own way, don't we? Yeah, and it's cool, right? Because it's like I get to build this legacy and people can say, oh, Diamond inspired or whatever, which is, you know, Honestly, that's all I'm here for is to inspire people. But it also has this like darker side where it's like you this imposter syndrome a lot. Like, do I belong in this space? Um, because I've just never seen it. Yeah. Sometimes the people that try to be entertaining and funny are the saddest on the inside, huh? Yes. I, I think that was a Robin Williams quote or something. Yeah, too, but. that's a good example. That's a good example. Yeah. He made everybody laugh, but he was dying and crying on the inside. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of like why I gravitated towards comedy. I remember like uh, my parent or my mom asked me when I was like six or something what I was to be when I grew up. I was like a comedian. Cause like I, I always found laughter in situations that really made me cry, but I had to find a way to, to make it a joke. So it felt um, outer body versus being personal. Yeah. So who are your heroes? Who is my hero? Oh, man. I would honestly say my hero right now, well, not even right now, but like my dad. Um, just because like um, – our relationship really changed, like reconnecting changed so much about my life. Like um, when uh, I got into the science center program, it was actually him who was trying to teach me independence, getting my first summer job when I was 14. Um, and basically that summer job um, ended up being a four year commitment that exposed me to engineering, exposed me to college and, and all of that. And my dad took me different college tours, check out colleges, helped me with the college applications. When I got my first internship, he drove me to Indiana to work for GM. So it was just like all of the like pivotal moments that helped me get to where I am. He was always present. Yeah. So that's my hero. There you go. I understand. <laughs> yes. So what do you think about the present state of the world? Woo. I know that's uh, big. Honestly, I think it's it's a it's necessary. Um so growing up where I, I grew up and how I grew up, um there was this this like almost stark contrast of like being in predominantly black spaces in like their level of acceptance and then i around sixth grade was in, admitted into this program and it literally was titled the deseg program as in desegregation um and i was bussed out to like suburban white areas to um go to school but the kids were like what are they doing here? 
Why are they here? Um, so when I think about where we stand politically or just socially, all of that has been festering for a minute and there's never been any true reconciliation. No. Um, so despite how violent and how much hate has came to the surface, it was needed. Um, I wholeheartedly believe in people living their truth, even if I don't accept it. Be who you are. Um, so I, I think like for me, it kind of, especially with like surviving the Trump era, <laughs> it kind of like brought to the forefront how people really view me yeah. or how people really view people who look like me or, you know, so that's, that's something that I haven't been um immune to but it became so loud these last couple years mm -hmm. um and i i hope like reconciliation happens um and even you know so much talk about going back to normal and normal normal wasn't really working for black people normal really wasn't working for lgbtq plus community it wasn't so um I really want to find out what's the new normal so um, we can all progressively move forward. And I think like, I'm trying to think who said the quote, but to really build something in your image or to transform anything, you have to first break it. And I think um, that's what happened over that four years uh, of the Trump era. Um, society was broken. Yeah. And it, it really leaves that space for healing now. So I hated it, but I also like knowing who my enemies are too. Yeah. Do you think things are going to get better anytime soon? Mm, I don't know. I really don't because um, I think that there was a voice that was awoken over these last you know, four years that was empowered, um, that sees uh, the horizon when you look at America statistically where um, minorities will be the majority at some point, um, they see that as a threat to uh, purity. So I think that somehow that needs to be resolved. And I'm saying that, that uh, those people need to be taken away or, or whatever whatever but it's just like what does that look like i'm not saying it's a, a kumbaya or best friends and no shit like that i don't think that's gonna exist but it has to be a space where you can be different i can be different and there's no fighting yeah that's what i would like to see um yeah. but i'm also <laughs> open to the idea of the people who were like oh trump you know doesn't get reelected. we're gonna move from america keep that same energy i would love to see it so i'm here for <laughs> both options <laughs> do you think in the united states overall the whole racism issue is getting any better is it better than it was let's say a decade ago i think I think it's just more exposure. So when you look at just having social media and being in this like information age, yeah, it's more exposed. Um, I like the conversations that's being, you know, had about um, bias and just uh, where, you know, just where racism looks like to people and just understanding like, um, how people were raised to think and just all these different like social constructs. I like that conversation, but um, conversations need to have action. That's the part I'm missing. We could talk about it all day long. It's great and therapeutic, but um, where's the action? That's what I would like to see. So what are your thoughts on white supremacy and white privilege? <laughs> oh, shit. You coming from the juggling. Um, I think it is quite interesting. Um, I, I never, obviously I don't support their vision. Um, and I'll tell you why. I don't think that minorities being who we are is a assault against who they are. 
And for some reason, when I say my life matter, it's taken as like, no, my life matters too. We're not saying that yours don't matter, but systemically, um, white people have never been oppressed. Like they've never experienced a, a fraction of what we have. Um, so it's like, that part is, is frustrating, right? Um, so I don't like the power element of it either. <laughs> it's, I, I respectfully disagree with their, you know, perspectives. It, it to me, is it's rubbish. It's an outdated way of thinking. Um, I think that, um, that level of hate is just unnecessary. Yeah, um, the least. Yeah, the cognitive dissonance that's associated with that, like, it, it's, I, part of me, like, wants to understand how desensitized you have to be to, like, humanity to see you as greater than somebody else. Yeah. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. You're not God. Like, structurally, we're all the same. It's literally just flesh suits with different colors. Yeah. So it's like, what what makes them think that that's the the gateway to like everything and white is right? I never understood that, um, and I, I don't think Me I will. Me <laughs> I don't think I will. Like I love humanity. I love um, people being fully themselves. However, if your full self is in a danger to society. Mm, you may need to, you know, go somewhere with that because that it, it can't, I don't want to live, well, I live in a world with that, so I can't say I don't want to live in a world, but it, it's just disheartening to see that that outdated mentality is still prevalent. So yeah. is systemic racism a real thing? Absolutely. Um, I've seen it. So like, in St. Louis, there's this um, north side of St. Louis, it's a street called Del Mar Boulevard. And I talk about this a lot just because that was my reality. On one side of the street, you have million dollar homes, gated community, beautiful architecture, like amazing area, right? Literally across the street, there is dilapidated homes. Um, the median household income, I think, is right at $12,000. Um, so I've seen systemic, you know, racism. I've seen it where it's like um, me as an engineer um, or becoming an engineer in undergrad, like um, going to physics labs and people not wanting to work with me, not because um, I had bad grades or anything. Like day one of class, they're like pair up in the groups. It was white guys in groups of four just to not work with me. And then when they saw I was finishing my physics labs faster than them and I, I got better grades than them, then they're like, oh, she's smart. But I'm in the same school as you. How am I not smart? So like it, it's just those different um, social, I don't know, preconceived notions about people. Um, that is frustrating and it's prevalent and I've experienced it and I've seen it. So it, it does exist. It's not like, it's not, I, I feel like the people who state that it doesn't exist are also the people who are, are like believing that um, QAnon or some random conspiracy theory exists. But there's something with factual evidence, there's data supporting that there is systemic oppression from a medical standpoint, from housing industries, financially, to educationally um, at work, like for black people. And it's like, no, I don't believe it. But something that has no evidence that is just post-truth or relative truth, you'll believe that wholeheartedly. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, it's kind of silly to me for people to deny systemic racism in the United States when this country was founded by four <laughs> white men. You had, to be yeah. rich, you had to be white, you had to be a man. 
And as you know, it was many years before anybody else even got to vote. And literally. I, yeah, literally. Yeah. So, so it's like, I, I never understand how people say it doesn't exist. You got chattel slavery for 400 something years. Then you got Jim Crow South for however long that was. Then like black people literally just got voting rights. Yeah. Like, and my grandparents, you know, were alive to experience it. Like we're not talking about something far off. Yeah. Like voting rights happened in the in the sixties. My mom was born. My dad was born then. So it's not like I think like that's the part that is so frustrating. Even when you look at how we went from, you know, being in slavery to civil rights, now we have rights. And for some reason, not even a good ten years later, now it's a crack era. So it's always been some type of assault against black people. And I have no, like, I, I would love to understand why. I would love to, you know, even the treatment of black people in the crack era, they were all criminalized. And a lot of people are like, oh, Joe Biden, da, 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 he helped with that. You know, we all got passed. Um, but it's like, when you look at the opioid epidemic today, <laughs> they're treated completely different than how black people in the 70s, 80s, 90s sh shit still today are treated. So it, I, I would love if I could ever get clarity on that. I don't know what it would solve for me, but it would be good to know, like, what did we ever do? Yeah, yeah good point. Yeah. So what do you think about Black Lives Matter, the organization, not the movement, but the organization itself? Is that a good thing? Um, I'm torn about it, to be, a, to be 100. I support the movement, right? Because my life matter, and I wholeheartedly believe it. Yeah. Um, but I also would love to see... Um, more policy behind it um you know like i would love to see that so but i'm also not as involved with it there are you know people who are spearheading the movement um i can't speak that much towards them um or towards their their missions and objectives but um i'm torn about it because i i just want to see I'm a numbers person, I'm a results person, so I wanna see results. Like chanting, marching, screaming, yeah, that shit's great, but what's the action? Like that, to me, like, I want to see action. Like that is what produces change. Like exposure and awakening people to our cry, I'm here for that as well, um, but we also need change and that's action. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So where do you see yourself five years from now? <sighs> five years from now? Man, I I see myself... Um, I've been really thinking about the UK a lot, so maybe there. Um, who knows? Yeah, what? The UK, moving there. Okay. Um, so maybe there, or maybe... Um, in Ghana or Nigeria with my husband at the time, or by then, I hope. Um, so you're engaged to a man in Nigeria? No, 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 he's Nigerian. Oh, he's, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So maybe either UK, Ghana, or Nigeria. Um, I see myself uh, really having this platform with knowledge and painting that's taking off. Um, I see that being my happy space in a space that would actually provide more for me than my job. Um, I see me continuing to teach and I see myself working my consulting business, but really um, focusing more on what brings me joy, which is podcasting. Okay. So what else would you like people to know about you before we wrap it up? Oh man, I I think I would like people to know that I'm curious. Um, 
I like to get understanding. Um, I like to try to get other people's perspectives as much as possible, just because it, it um, actions, people's actions confuse me. So I want to understand them <laughs> a lot because <laughs> it just makes my head itch. Um, I am ambitious, I'm driven, I'm determined. Um, and I am a force to be reckoned with. Like, I think what I'm doing in a space that I'm creating for people to fully be themselves um, is needed. I think that, um, you know, people have been molded to someone else's perception of what they should be for a while. And um, people are tired. And I, I want to help people find their space and facilitate a space for them to be there. Good. Me too. That's what I'm trying to do here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us about knowledge and, yeah, knowledge and what is pettiness? Pettiness. <laughs> yeah. So, um, knowledge and pettiness is the happiest space on earth to me. And um, it was birthed out of um, me being in, in um, traditional engineering, being the only black woman um there i felt like a lot of companies that i worked for they said they wanted diversity but they really wanted a simulation wow. and um i got frustrated with feeling like damn i can't be myself and i'll come home and have anxiety and panic attacks because i had to present a palatable version uh to be accepted by them um and that is exhausting like if you spend all day trying to not be yourself um you get to this point of like resentment um and um like in may of last year i just kind of um just came to the space where i was like fuck it like if people don't like me if they don't like um who i am that's they bad like i have to live my truth and whatever that is um and i was like what would i call the like I was thinking about a podcast. I was like, what the hell to call it? Um, and I had got a friend a book and I'm the type of person, if I buy you a book, a card or whatever, I put a quote in there and then I have a signature or something. And I actually signed his book, uh, sincerely. Um, no, nah, yeah, I said sincerely knowledge and pay to you or something. And I was like, oh shit, that's the podcast. That's me. Um, because I am full of knowledge. I'm also very fucking petty. So I wanted to make a space where I could be there and it's in the title so you know what it is. Like, I will tell you things that are very um, informative, but I also am going to show my personality. I also am going to present my rawest, most authentic self. And that's not for everybody and that's cool too, but that's me. Now, that's what your t-shirt says, knowledge and pettiness, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us why you spell it knowledge the way you do. Um, I spell knowledge this way because um, in Black culture, we uh, it was a shirt that was created um, to represent what Rosa Parks was sitting, were saying when she was not giving up her seat. And it said, nah, like N-A-H. I was like, I like that. So when I thought about how to spell knowledge, I was like, I want to put that in there, like knowledge. Yeah. So it's like this twist on like the type of knowledge that's being presented, um, like a more culturally, um, like a lens from a culture uh, knowledge. So that's kind of how I did the twist on that. So if anybody wants to look up your podcast on YouTube, they need to know how to spell knowledge. That's N A L E D G E, right? Yes. So it's on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google, iHeartRadio, Pandora, all of the outlets. Okay. It's there. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being my guest. No, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. This was this was fun. Yeah. Maybe we'll do it again sometime. I will live it. Okay. Well, I'm going to let you go, and I'll say good night, and I will upload this to YouTube and get it on social media and send you a copy and links. You do whatever you want to do with it, and maybe we can tell everybody about knowledge and pettiness. 
I would like it in any way that I can support you as well. Thank you very much. And you have yourself a wonderful evening. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you.